Herbie, you and I have been around a while, and this is, you know, we are seeing the effects over our lifetimes, the changes. Yeah. But what I worry about is, you know, what are we leaving as a legacy for our children and our grandchildren? Well, we are leaving the greatest debts in history to future generations, partly because of our industrially based lifestyles, partly because uh, of the enormous use of uh, fossil fuels, partly because of the pollution and so on, uh, soil erosion, all of these things. So it's a huge legacy. And we are indebted to future generations to do things differently. And my organization, the World Future Council, is trying to do exactly that, helping to pass legislation today that can have a beneficial impact and reduced uh, impact on, uh, on, on future generations. So these are really critical measures that are now needed in order to uh, assure that we leave children a good planet rather than one that we have wrecked for them. But Herbie, we, you talk about your council, World Futures Council, and you know we write in One Climate about you know future justice. Yeah. But what can we do, really? I mean, isn't it up to, for example, these national leaders to think in the terms? And yet, as you said, they are years behind the curve. They're still, even the the most enlightened of them are still thinking. Fight, well, not the most, but you know many of them are thinking in terms of an old paradigm. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, but I mean, the, the, we are living in a very schizophrenic world now. We have the old dinosaurs still running the show by and large, but then you also have green parties in, in countries across Europe that have a share in the power, sometimes uh, in coalition governments, and they are really introducing significant new legislation, for instance, feed-in tariffs for renewable energy, which is, has the effect of if you have a solar roof in Germany, in Spain, in Portugal, you can sell the electricity that you produce a four times the price of a conventional power station. So you've had this enormous impact at the local level, driven by national policy, enabling people to run their houses on, the, uh, on electricity that they produce themselves, obviously augmented by wind energy and, and so on. So in this country, about 40%, I think, now of the electricity is produced by renewable technology like this. In Germany, it's about 15% going up fast. So these are measures that we can take today to look after future generations tomorrow. Well, a couple of things that arise from that. This sense of decentralized power generators or, or regular citizens like us, that's, that's a very exciting concept. And um, I often think that the kind of citizen journalism, if you like, yeah. model is now coming into the energy field. It's like um, citizen energy production. Yeah, and and by doing that, people, first of all, appreciate energy and its value. Mm. And secondly, they stop being in the power of the big energy companies yeah. Yeah. who have up till now really determined what we do. And we've felt very helpless. So that empowerment in itself is sounds to me like a, a good idea and 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 do you feel i mean you're a communicator you're a filmmaker you're you're an author i mean how does communication fit with this new change in attitude towards energy use well you're doing a great job with your with your website <laughs> that's very kind no you you do it's, it's very very important indeed uh, we of course if it's um, the media, we still haven't got enough of a voice by the, by, by the fact that we can never compete with the repeated messages of advertising, for instance. So that is a huge problem, that we are not able to speak loudly and shout loudly enough. Nevertheless, there are new grassroots movements, for instance, the Transition Towns movements in the UK, which is really remarkable. Suddenly, all over the country in the UK, but that's also happening in other parts of Europe and so on, community groups are saying, we want to recapture power for the people in this town, in this village and so on. And, uh, but they're often frustrated as well because they do not, in the UK for instance, have nat national legislation that allows them to do the things that they would like to do to rebuild the local economy, to restart uh, uh, local, local energy systems and all these uh, things that they want to do. So we need much more empowerment and we need to demand that and I call it democracy 2.0, a new kind of democracy that we need to delve into. And that is certainly not just about, uh, about uh, voices, but also about electricity, about agriculture and, and about uh, local economies that we need to rebuild. 
Happy, that's wonderful. Um, we don't have very much time left, but I believe there's a question that's come in. Is yeah. My colleague from One Climate. I just want to remind everybody that we're broadcasting live on oneclimate.net, and uh, you can post any questions or comments for our view for our guests there. Uh, you can also use the Twitter hashtag OneClimate. Um, one thing that a lot of people are talking about on Twitter, I noticed recently, uh, is this BBC documentary that's talking about cities, and um, it compares Los Angeles and Mumbai. Uh, and in Mumbai, it says um, that the car is the ultimate status symbol in Mumbai. And I know you've done a lot of work around cities. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about how the evolution of some of these mega cities in developing countries is impacting climate change and whether you see the, the city as uh, the major problem causing climate change or, or potentially one of the solutions. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the city uh, that sprang up in the world since the Industrial Revolution, you could call it Petropolis. Before that, we had Agropolis, a city growing out of the landscape in which it grew up. Uh, today, we have Petropolis, a city depending on fossil fuels. And certainly, when you look at European or American cities, but particularly American ones, they are utterly and totally dependent on very cheap fuel. And they've grown on the back of availability of large quantities of cheap fuel. When you look at places like Mumbai, uh, there too, you have a great dependence on fossil fuels for their urban growth because certainly the transport systems including the cars uh, but also the, the food that is trucked in and out and the waste that has to be taken away and so on also depends on fossil fuels but they are much more energy efficient no question about that than cities in Europe and America they are also much more resource efficient in terms of recycling and, and local food supplies so we have a great deal to learn from cities of India, from cities of South America in terms of sustainability. Nevertheless, they are vastly uh, greater than anything before in human history and they are a problem in terms of uh, sustainability. Cities have the potential to be uh, solution providers given the fact that we can't all, with huge numbers of people today, live scattered across uh, landscapes in the way we were in the past. We certainly need to realize that we cannot avoid having substantial cities, large cities in different parts of the world. Nevertheless, we need to learn from best examples, again, from around the world. And that's, in fact, there is a mayor's conference taking place right now, retrofitting existing cities, making them reduce up to three quarters less energy in Europe or America than they currently do, or in, indeed in India, assuring that waste recycling systems, particularly also organic wastes, can be effectively reused as fertilizer and that kind of stuff, which currently is not being done very effectively. Well, thank you very much, Abby. As ever, uh, new and fresh ideas and, and some hope in that. And, 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 you know, the idea that somehow these mega cities in the south may be actually more efficient, you know, and have more ideas to, uh, for us to learn from in the north. We always hear about technology transfer one way, and it's great to hear about technology transfers and creativity transfers the other way as well. So thank you very much, Anid. Thank you, Herbie.